Good morning. Today is Sunday, July 19th. This is worship from the First Congregational Church of Clarendon. And yes, I am at home. Just in case I was exposed to COVID, it seemed like an advisable thing for me to use the best precaution. And so I hope to be worshiping in church next Sunday, but this Sunday we are doing worship from my home. So as we begin, our theme today is that of being alive in Christ. Now, know that Paul wrote three letters from prison, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Colossians, of course, is what we've been working through for the last few weeks. So Paul has some similar themes intertwined within these three letters, and it's great to hear these things come up again and again. One being uh, a similar theme to our today's lesson coming from Ephesians chapter 2. Let me share a little bit with you. And Paul writes, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead with in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So that idea of being alive in Christ, it is a gift. It is a joy we receive uh, to think that we who had been dead before are now considered alive by the work of Christ within us. For we are made alive because God called us alive. However you put it, we are part of the body of Christ. He is our life working within us. We live within him and he lives within us. So as we gather for worship together, may you know how you are fully alive in Christ. Let's worship God. Good morning, kids. Since I'm at home today, I thought I would show you some of the shoes that takes up residence just inside our back door. So we have work boots and sandals and hiking boots, more sandals and clogs and sneakers and various shoes of different reasons to have them around. So if I were going to a fancy party, I wouldn't wear work boots. But if I was going out to be in the garden, sure don't want to wear my high-heeled shoes. And so there's different places we go depending on which shoe we are wearing. Well, Paul says to us today, he says, God made you alive in Christ. Well, are any of these shoes alive? No. Can they by themselves take us where we want to go? No. It takes our feet inside of those shoes to give us the places where we're going to go. And I think of that in terms of how Jesus is inside of us. Jesus is giving us good direction on where we are to go. And Jesus is helping us be alive in ways that we could not were we not to have Jesus inside of us. It's not me doing things, but Jesus living in me that helps me be the kind of person I want to be. And so, just like shoes, they don't really go any place on their own. They need us. And so us, without Jesus, we really can't go any place real good either. So let's keep Jesus inside, helping us become the people that God wants us to be and fully alive in Christ. Let's have a prayer about that. Dear God, thank you for you to make us alive in Christ. You work from within us, guiding us, helping us saying the right things, helping us go in the right places, and all for your glory and your honor. Thank you, Lord, for being inside us 
and making us alive in you. Amen. to our time of prayer and let us as God's people be lifted up as we lift up those who are high on our list of concerns, people whom we love and miss, just those whom we want to be sure to hold in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, touch us with your presence as we come together as your people. By your spirit, help us receive your love and know that in Christ you have deemed us worthy. Forgive us of all that weighs us down. For we want to give our troubles to you, our failures to you, our discouragement to you so that we may be set free. For it is you who has the power 
not us. And you know, Lord, that sometimes we face more than our share of difficulties, which can seem more than we can bear. But when we do not have our own strength, bless us with your peace. When we realize we have too much to do, too little time, you can be the light for our path. And in these days of the pandemic that continue to escalate and we see more pain, more death, remind us that it was Jesus who took upon himself our pain on the cross. Lord, in all we do, may we let Jesus be revealed to the glory of your name. For you give us such awesome promises, promises we can hardly understand or envision, but we believe that by his death, Jesus offers us forgiveness, and by his life, we also will be raised to live with you forever. So may we thank you and praise you and honor you in all that we say and do to give you the glory today and every day. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus and thereby put our temporary today's problems into perspective. So here are prayers, Lord, for those who are especially on our minds this day. Maybe those who have had some surgery. Maybe those who are just continuing to deal with medical issues all those who are sequestered at home. We pray for those who have tested positive for COVID and those who worry that they could be next. We pray for our country and for the divisions that harm us all. We pray for our children who will have an online vacation Bible school this year it's not going to be the same, but Lord, may your bill will be done through it. We offer all our prayers in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray, as Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture passage for today is as we are continuing to read through Colossians. We are now on chapter 2 and we have but a few verses to read beginning with verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive. In Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. May we Give our honor and praise to our God, who enables us to read and understand his holy word. To God be the glory. Amen. So our scripture passage, it's a fairly short one today, only three verses. But it is packed with truths that may be uncomfortable to receive. Reading it, I realize again what a great difference there is in Paul's teaching style from that of Jesus. 
You remember how Jesus often taught the crowds in parables, stories that are deceptively simple, though profound in meaning. His parables were memorable because he talked about everyday situations that people could relate to. Lost sheep, lost sons, lost coins. Maybe today we would substitute lost phones, lost credit cards, lost car keys. But the truth is the same. God keeps searching for us in the same way that we keep searching for things of value that we have misplaced. Many times Jesus shared a parable and gave those who were ready to listen the means of perceiving a truth about God's kingdom. Yes, he was confrontational when he needed to be, and especially with the Pharisees. They were critical of what they perceived to be his breaking of Sabbath laws. But if Jesus was often indirect in his teaching style, Paul laid it out in plain words. So he begins today in saying that once you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. Well, there is nothing subtle about those words. Understand, though, Paul was writing to a church body of believers, and though he was blunt, he knew that they would understand what he says. Spiritually, you were dead because of your sins. Now, who would call themselves dead? except those who have accepted the invitation from Jesus to become alive in him. If we think we're fine just as we are, there is nothing that will compel us to make a change. Now, he expected them to understand that once they were lost, but now they are found, like the words of amazing grace. If we don't understand that we are lost, why would we ask somebody to give us directions? Imagine for a moment that you are directionally challenged, like one of my daughters. And there was a memorable time when she was driving across town to get to someone's house. Um, she was in unfamiliar territory, and as she started to come home, she started going west instead of east. She drove for quite a while before she realized something wasn't quite right. She asked directions and headed the other way. The funny thing was, as she was headed now in the right direction towards home, somehow she didn't realize it, that she had passed it and she was almost to Pennsylvania before she got herself turned around once again. She drove for over three hours of what should have been maybe an hour's drive home. Now you put that in the context of our faith and we know that there are people who wander around with no direction. They have no use for Jesus Christ. They don't gather as the body of Christ. And, and they have separated themselves from an active relationship with God. Maybe they profess a token belief in God. Maybe they're opposed to faith in God completely. But they're content for who they are, flaws and all. And they basically leave God out of their daily lives. Well, isn't it the truth that you can't be found if you don't realize that you are lost? And in the same way, if you are not convinced that you are spiritually dead, you will have no reason to seek a new life through Jesus Christ. It would be no use for me to go to a cemetery and try to convince the residents there, buried in that cemetery, to wake up. I can't do that. But I may have a friend who has wandered from faith. And again, on my own, I can't compel that person to make a fresh start. But I say here these words of Paul when he says, God made you alive with Christ, because it is God who will raise all who have died 
And one day we will stand before the Lord in judgment to give account for the life we have lived. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit that ultimately convicts a person of sin and brings one to faith. And even though we may witness to others about the faith we hold, it is the Holy Spirit that actually does the work. And, and so what Paul is telling us in our scripture today is that we have three needs. We need new life in Christ. We need forgiveness. And we need to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. Paul records a time when Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, he was a member of the Jewish council, came to speak with Jesus. Now, Nicodemus said, clearly Jesus is a teacher who has come from God because of the miraculous things that Jesus was doing. Yet, surprisingly, Jesus replied to him, saying, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, Nicodemus did not understand Jesus that day. And that can be just as hard for us to understand. We were separated from God until we trusted in Christ our Savior, until we were reconciled by his work on the cross. Pick the word that makes the most sense to you. You can say we were dead. You can say we were alienated, separated, or that we were lost. However we say it, know there is a great difference between the way God viewed us before we met Christ and what that relationship is like now. We were separated back then. We are reconciled now. We face judgment before, but now our judgment is covered by the blood of Christ who reclaimed us from death. For it is by grace that we are saved and made new. So Paul says we were made alive with Christ. So what makes you feel the most alive by your faith? I feel alive in Christ when I feel God's working through a person or a situation that brings about good or ushers in peace. I feel Christ in my life through prayer, who encourages me, even challenges me to make real changes in my life. I feel alive in Christ when I'm reading a passage of scripture and the words just leap off my page because in that moment, I know that God is speaking to me. I feel alive in Christ when I can finally let go of old, resol unresolved hurts and grievances and, and finally be able to lay them to rest by God's grace. During this time of COVID, um, as a second wave or continued wave or whatever you want to call it of this escalation of new cases keeps going on, it may feel like um, death, uh, hurt, pain is all around us. And yet, I want us to consider how we may be alive in Christ. Despite the news, despite the numbers of cases that are going up in the country. You may have read, as I did this week, about someone who went to a so-called COVID party in Texas, and there he contracted the virus, which caused his death. He was all of 30. Then nearer to home in Port Clinton, a 37-year-old man he refused to wear masks. He had posted on social media that COVID was just a big hype. Well, guess what? He also contracted it and died. Each of them made a mistake that cost them their lives. 
I don't think any of us want to believe that we will contract the disease, uh, much less that any of us are going to suffer consequences of complication, not much less die from it. And yeah, I'm home today because the last thing I want to do is to engage in risky behavior that could possibly harm someone else. God knows whether a person who dies whether that person was made right before God, before their physical death. It's not for you or me to judge because any one of us can and do make both unintentional mistakes as well as deliberate wrongs. Every one of us, because of our humanity, will do this. Only Jesus remained without sin so only Jesus has the capacity to deliver us from those wrongs that we do. And this is what Paul says. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, Paul talked about um, our forgiveness in chapter 1, and now he's talking about it again here in chapter 2. And Paul reminds us that the law cannot ever be our salvation because all it can do is show us how we are unable to completely follow every law. Instead, it is Jesus who has taken away the mistakes, the wrongs that hang over our heads, because he took them all and put them on himself. I've heard it said, and maybe you have too, I'm a good person. I try to live a moral life. Surely I don't desire, deserve to die for anything I have done. But I don't want to discount all that Jesus has done for me, nor do I want to presume that I have God's perspective. I can't put myself in God's place. I'm not able to comprehend the way God views how we undermine God's authority when we float his laws. But I also can't imagine how Jesus would decide to send Jesus for our sake. I can hardly imagine the level of love and forgiveness that God displays time and again, in spite of all the wrongs we do. For God decided that what Jesus accomplished on the cross was enough once for all time. And God only asks that we believe in Christ, that we call him a savior, ask to be forgiven, repent, and do our best to change. Paul writes about one other problem facing our world, which is the presence of evil. He writes, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We just said the Lord's Prayer, where we ask, deliver us from evil. Now, when Jesus died, it may have seemed is so evil one. For he who knew no sin was condemned to die in the most shameful, humiliating, painful death. It should have been the end that evil won. But we know by his resurrection that it was but the beginning, demonstrating that death and the worst wrongs we can fathom have no hold on Jesus. And as we believe in him, though our earthly bodies will come to a physical end, our souls will be kept safe unto eternal life. This is a promise we may trust, that just as Christ is risen, so we will be risen, we will be raised to eternal life with him. No doubt, the wrongs of this world are pervasive, heart-wrenching. People suffer 
because of so many wrongs, tragedy, disease, natural disasters, racism, wrongdoing, warfare, famine, all these and more. Evil is a force to be reckoned with right now, but it cannot win in the end. For we know the end of the story. We will not be held captive because Christ has won victory over the grave. You, you have been made alive with Christ. You, you are forgiven because God has taken away the chain of our laws and commands that bind us because we cannot fully keep them and be sinless. Jesus took them all, all our wrongs, all our mishaps, and put them on himself. And he did it on the cross. Therefore, God promises us victory over our earthly death, for nothing can or ever will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Savior. May God's name be praised forever. Amen. And now as we conclude our time of service together, may the power of God strengthen you. May the words of Jesus be your treasure and the presence of the Holy Spirit find a place within your heart. God be with you. Till we meet again. Amen.